and welcome to the Doofcast, a film and TV podcast from Doof Media. My name is Scott Daly, and Matt Freeman is off this week, so I'm joined by a special guest. You know him as Elliot Diebold, but around here, we just call him the Mushroom Man. How's it going today, Elliot? It's a me, <laughs> Elliot. That's the that's the wrong mushroom. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. And that movie's coming out like next week, isn't it? The Mario movie? Yeah, I think it is. I. I can't tell if I'm very excited or dreading that movie. It's going to make a a gazillion dollars. That's the only thing I know. Yeah, yeah, I think it's going to do very well. Uh, We are we are so happy to have you back on the show, Elliot. It's been it's been a long, long time. We were just talking about that before we hit record. (laughs) That it's been like three years since you were able to come back on, and that was when you and you and Ruben uh, were here to talk about the worst season of The Legend of Korra, (laughs) and. And that season was so bad that we've just never talked about Korra again. <laughs> I'm still really bad because season three is my favorite. And somehow we haven't managed to make that one happen. I think it's honestly just, you know, you've been very busy with your show and we've been very yeah. busy with our shows and, and getting time on each other's uh, calendars when we are also, what, um, eight, 12, 14 hours apart time wise. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's some it's too many hours. <laughs> Yeah. Speaking of of what you've been working on, I thought before we get into our our main topic for today, we'd at least talk to you about how that's going. You are you are performing and doing a show with Ruben called The Pale Reflections. You've been doing that for how many years now? Probably about the it, same amount of time as since you were last on this show. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it'll be three years uh, at the start of May. That is absolutely insane. Uh, it it's a, it's a story by by our good friend Wild Bo, who we did the uh, we've got Worm and we've got Ward podcast on. I thought Elliot, it would be fun. Um, we have a bunch of new listeners from our Stephen King show, and I thought you know they know what Worm is because we incessantly talk about it on that show, but they don't really know what Pact and Pale are. So before we get started this week, I thought it'd be fun to just tell tell me what in your opinion is these stories that Wild Bo has been writing for five years now. <laughs> Sure. Well, uh, in my completely unbiased opinion, they're his best stories. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and so the the Pact and Pale universe is um, in much the same way Worm and Ward were, you know, kind of superheroes done right or whatever. Pact and Pale is all the kinds of urban fantasy magic sort of stuff. Um, and so Pale, uh, which we're following on Pale Reflections, which we just kind of stole your We've Got Ward formula uh, to do. <laughs> Um, is basically about three young girls who uh, get introduced to the secret world of magic by uh, the sort of local monsters that live in their town who have various agendas and there's sort of a magical murder mystery. And this is a world where anyone involved in the magical side of the world can't lie. So what seems initially is a fairly straightforward murder to solve because people can't lie. How hard can that be? (laughs) <laughs> uh, quickly spirals out of control um and it's yeah an incredibly rich world it's one of those ones where um it feels it, there's like 20 magic systems kind of going on at once and each one feels mm-hmm. like it could be its own entire franchise but they're all playing sure. off of each other um yeah it's and uh yeah so between i don't know great characters great magic it's just it's a lot of fun yeah, I mean, I obviously have not read Pale, but I did read Pact, the story that takes place in the same universe as this one, but is not. This is not technically a sequel to. It's mm. a, an, an adjacent cool. Is that a phrase? Yeah, I, a side cool is what I've called it, which I think is technically a different thing. But it's yeah, it they're two stories that happen in the same world, but they're not related. They're you know yeah. in different parts of it. Yeah, and I think, you know, if we have any of our, our Stephen King fans out there, I think if you are the type of person that perhaps really enjoys Stephen King but gets frustrated at the obtuseness of his world building in which there's not really any rules and sometimes things just happen that have been pre-established, I think you would definitely get a kick out of, of this world because the rules of the magic systems and the rules of all the systems in these books are very specific and uh, a, a lot of the fun of the book is about the the playing with that kind of specific specificity um and i mean i really enjoyed pact i i promise i will read pale one day uh, <laughs> it's so it's so it's so long now though it's the longest thing he's ever written right yes yeah it's uh wow. it's getting up there i think it's it's 
just, it's past ward at this point for sure. Wow. Wow. Um, well. But yeah, no, it's a great it, it's a great magic system for something. And I, you know, I'm amazed he's still able to do this uh, three or four million words in, or however far we are now. <laughs> um, there's constantly twists where somebody will pull something with the magic system, and you're like, "What? They could they could do that?" And then and then you sit and think about it, and you're like, "In retrospect, of course, of course, that was in the cards." <laughs> uh, which is my favorite kind of twist, that sort of one that yeah. catches you off guard and then you think about it and you're like, no, actually, that makes sense. Uh, and it, that happens all the time. No, that's 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 fantastic. Um, so, yeah, if you're all interested uh, in Pale or Pact or or the shows that, that uh, Elliot and his co-host Ruben are doing on them, you should check them out. Check out Pale Reflections. Check out Deep in Pact, which was the show you did on that first book as well. Although yeah. that, one, that one you went crazy on because you did like – an episode a chapter which was just luckily it's a much shorter story but yeah i don't know what we were thinking yeah we I, got through I it somehow <laughs> i i think i told you that you're yeah. crazy when you first told me the idea but uh that's okay those those are all available on uh the doof website doofmedia.com and uh mm-hmm. and also wherever podcasts are so enough about uh plugging you <laughs> let's <laughs> let's get into the topic of the week which is as you've seen on the the title of this episode the last of us and we are going to be talking about the first season of the hbo tv show but we also wanted to talk about the video game because elliot you are you know a big into games you 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 and ruben also ran the game club for us here for a bit and then you've also worked in the industry before so you've got a lot of thoughts about video games thoughts that i find really fascinating i love talking with you about <laughs> games so I thought it'd be fun, you know, to not just talk about the TV show, but let's talk about the video game as well. So uh, that's yeah. that's what we're going to be doing today. Don't worry, folks. No season two spoilers. No part two spoilers. Because I think Elliot, you're only partially the way through part two, right? Yeah, from what I've been told, I'm just over halfway through. Yeah. So yeah. um, okay. And it seems like yeah, a big change has just happened, which people have told me is the halfway point. So. Yep. yep. Um, so no spoilers at all for part two. We'll leave that all off the table this week, but uh, let's get into it, Elliot. I, I Let's talk about The Last of Us. So you, this video game, and I think we'll start with the video game, you sure. you only played it recently, right? Yeah, I managed to finish about a week before the show started, I think it was. It was, uh, I, I got right up to the deadline. And what uh, what kept you away from it? Because you know, I, I I know you are a fan of the Naughty Dog games. I know you really enjoy the Uncharted series and had played yeah. all those. So what what kept you away from The Last of Us for so long? It was the I, I when I first tried to play it, I really bounced off the like the both the stealth and I'm not a fan of uh generally speaking not a fan of um like really tight resource management and having to scavenge and craft stuff like um i'm very i have a very short attention span when i play games a lot of the time i always need to be doing and um uncharted lend it, lends itself to that spectacularly oh, sure. that it's a walking action movie that game um <laughs> and uh, the last of us is is not that it's it's much more deliberate it kind of slows you down i think when i first picked it up i was expecting uncharted but with zombies uh mm-hmm. and when i didn't get that i just was like oh this game wants me to think about not spraying bullets everywhere and take my time <laughs> no thank you um and i also i don't know if i played the game or a demo because what i ended up playing a couple of months ago was different <laughs> to what i remember playing i definitely played the only i only remember playing the bit in like the skyscraper when you're with tess and ellie which is like chapter two or three Mm -hmm. um it's not uh the you know the scene pre um end of the world with um sarah oh that opening Uh, yeah yeah uh so i i had no memory of that i only remembered walking around with ellie in a uh skyscraper so i don't know how that happened um oh, interesting but i also didn't start at the start of the game and it must have been a demo or something sure sure yeah so i guess i guess what is it about this game because obviously this is a you know a hugely successful game spawned a sequel that also sold really really well you know, regarded as one of the the best games ever, I think I think people, myself included, you know, think of the the storytelling in this game as some of the best storytelling that mm. 
uh, that video games have accomplished. And obviously now we're seeing it's it's been adapted into a prestige HBO uh, uh, TV show that I think is a first for video games ever. Um, what 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 is it? I mean, it did you you obviously eventually got into the game as you were playing it? Did it did it work on you eventually? Did you get past the things yeah. about it you didn't like? Yeah, I think it just took me a while to get get on the right like frequency um mm-hmm. and get into it. I definitely I, I was loving it by the end. I'm also traditionally, like just generally speaking, not a big story game person. Um That's right. Yeah. 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 Which we you know, I, I know we've definitely had conversations off air about in the past. Cause I gen generally in video games I view story as at best the icing on the cake sort of thing. But I'm really here for the the gameplay and I don't like when games make me stop playing to show me cutscenes. <laughs> um sure so yeah that was probably another barrier to get me into the last of us because it, especially when everyone's constantly talking about how it's the story that's their favorite part as somebody who's not really big into that generally i'm kind of like well you know it'll be a tv show one day i can just do it then uh which <laughs> happened um well yeah there for you some go. reason there you go. my <laughs> My response to hearing it was being a TV show is, geez, I better play it first. So I don't know what I'm doing, I think. <laughs> no, that's great. And I like how you called them conversations that we've had about your your uh, lack of interest in video game stories. I, I would probably call them fights, but um, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's okay. And, and no, I mean, I, I do think, you know, I think generally, and I, I don't think it's crazy for me to say this, I think video game storytelling broadly in general isn't the best um you know even even some of the games that are mostly lauded for their storytelling which is like you know the rpg genre is one that like well it's the Mm. story the story is a great like i i played all of the final fantasy games over the course of the pandemic when i was uh, waiting to see if i was going to have a job or not um spoilers no i wasn't um (laughs) but I, i i replayed all those games and and i I have fond memories of those games and I don't think I really liked a story in a single one of them. I just didn't like the writing. I didn't think it was very good. Like, I think there's great, great ideas in a lot of different games, but the, the beat to beat moment to moment character storytelling, I just found really lacking in, in most video games that I play. And this was definitely one of the ones where I was like, Oh wow, this thing is actually yeah. working on me from a storytelling perspective these are characters i'm actually caring about and they actually feel like real living characters and i mean what do you did they unlock some secret or was it just them kind of aping ironically like the prestige tv model a little bit I, that's that's where i'd lean because I, I definitely feel like this is a uh um thing sony very intentionally started to lean into in the early 2010s mm-hmm. like uh yeah obviously god of war pivoted from being like a mostly action game with a kind of tacked on story to, you know, now the, the last two God of War games have been incredibly story focused as well. True. Um, and yeah, I, I think I like, I'd, I'd think of most of the Sony first party games now as much more being they're taking classical storytelling, like doing a good job telling stories and then applying it to a video game um whereas like traditionally i'm more of a fan of um like outer wilds is my go-to that Mm -hmm. that is a story that you can't tell uh in another medium like i can't even begin to comprehend what an adaptation of something like outer wilds um (laughs) or would would look like and same same to an extent with even uh the one where where we had you and matt come on for the game called the forgotten city yeah yeah um Mm -hmm. Like that was another one that I thought did a good job of kind of using the medium and like something I do find a little frustrating with uh, some of these Sony ones is to an extent it does kind of feel like they are movies merged with video games, but I, I'm getting softer on my criticism of that having actually started to engage with the really good ones. Yeah, no, this is this is a really interesting line of thought, um, and I, I'm glad we're we're heading here here at the beginning because i i genuinely generally agree with you that like when i'm playing a video game i and if i'm playing a video game for story which is you know unlike you one of the big (laughs) reasons i go to games for um I, i would prefer it to be the type of game in which the story is integrated to the point where this is this is an experience that is truly unique to this medium and i think outer Mm. wilds is such a fantastic example of that one of my favorite games of all time definitely my favorite experience with a video game in the past five years loved that game to death um 
and and I think the storytelling was so enriched by how the game works and is designed and plays. I I will say like, I mean, obviously The Last of Us is a game that can work perfectly as a TV show um, because they did it. And now we know we we have that piece of evidence very clearly right here that says, (laughs) hey, there's nothing unique about the story that makes it only suitable for a video game. I do think there is some truth to the idea, though, that the moments of this game are a little bit more emotionally impactful, hit you a little bit harder. The character choices dig a little bit deeper into you not because you the the player um actually have the power to sway the character away from those choices but because even though the story is dictating those choices and the characters are dictating those choices in the at the end of the day you are the one controlling them yeah. towards that right you you have to do it often like yeah. that's that's when this game excels i think is when it makes a character make mm-hmm. a choice and then makes you do it for them um yeah. 100% I, and I definitely, I think watch playing The Last of Us and then immediately watching it and also shout out to the, um, there was also a podcast that accompanied the the show um, yeah, that featured yeah. Neil Druckmann and Craig Mazin um, on it. And they talked a lot about why they made changes they did. And I definitely grew to appreciate the differences in the mediums and, and how Last of Us was using the medium better than I'd originally uh, given it credit for as a game. Um, but I, yeah, there's like, there's definitely moments where the last of us uses the fact that it's a video game to heighten some of those emotional beats. Mm-hmm. Um, and the show doesn't get that for some of them. And you really feel the difference, uh, some of the time. Yeah. I mean, and, and this is not to disparage any of the performances in the video game, because I think the voice actors are doing an incredible job, but like, I feel like the, the moments that worked on me the best emotionally in the show were just these actors were fucking killing it and really yeah. selling the characters to me or in the video game. Some of it is emotional because, Oh, you're the one that has to do that thing. Like, like the, the ending is, is a great example of this, that like Joel makes this choice at the end of this video game. And I don't know why I'm being coy about it. Like we're not going to have to spend 20 minutes talking about <laughs> the ending and spoiling it completely. But Joel makes this choice, but it's not just Joel that makes that choice. Even though Joel makes the choice, Joel then says, okay, the controller's in your hand now, buddy. Yeah please massacre all these people to get me to Ellie. And there's definitely a part of you that's like, yeah, I'm on board, but there's also another part of you that every time you pull the trigger and kill another one of these people where you're like, Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if I feel good about this actually. Well, and there was a great gameplay decision made there that I love. This is the only point in the game where they let you have an automatic weapon the yep. whole game has been sniper rifles, shotguns, like really slow weapons that, that make you careful with ammo. And then in this final level, they just give you an assault rifle and they're like, go mm-hmm. ham, kill everyone. And yeah. it made me feel like more of a monster What just mowing people down like that in the end. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and I've... God, we have to talk about this ending. Um, let's just let's just do it now. Why are we sure. why are we <laughs> why are we saving it? Um, I, I think this is one of the most fascinating endings in in video game history, and I and we'll get to the TV mm. show in a bit. And I think the I think the show manages to pull it off about as well as it possibly could uh, in in a TV format. And the thing I love about this ending so much is that here years later, I don't remember when this first game came out, but I think it's been almost a decade now. I still go back and forth on the way I feel about it. And (laughs) and also my life experiences have changed considerably in that amount of time too, to where I've recontextualized things because you have a, you have a kid now, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Like, like I was sitting here watching the TV show and also thinking about the video game ending. And of course the thing I did after the, the TV show ended because I like to hurt myself is I pulled up YouTube and then watched a playthrough of the video game ending again, just to remind myself of, of what it was, uh, I don't know why I did that, but, <laughs> and, and I was, I was forced to reckon with this, this simple truth of my life, which is, I don't think Joel did the right thing, but if someone came and knocked on my door right now and said to me, Scott, your son is the key to saving humanity. Uh, give him to us and we will say, we will cure cancer. Cancer will go away. Right. And all it will cost mm. is a life of your son. I would say, 
no fucking way. And if you try to take him from me, I will kill every single one of you. Like I have no doubt in my mind that that would be my reaction to that. So like mm-hmm. having that, that simple truth in my mind, I, I was forced to reckon with the fact that like, gosh, I, I mean, I think what he did was wrong, but <laughs> I also think what he did makes a, a complete level of sense like th- that it, it is so complex and rich and it you know yeah. you're 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 pinging off of joel's characterization and the changes that he's made over the course of the game and then ellie's characterization and the changes that she's made over the course of the game and what ellie wants and what ellie needs and what joel wants and what joel needs and all these things just like perfectly coalesce into this one moment where you're just like I wish I had an easy answer about whether this was good or bad. Um, but, but I just don't. Well, I guess what, what's your, what's your take on it? Yeah, no, I found the same. I kind of, I, I'm like, yeah, big picture. Like you sort of take that utilitarian sort of standpoint. You're like, well, clearly this was a terrible thing to do. He's potentially yeah. cost millions of lives. Mm-hmm. Um, but then also, uh, like I, I feel like the game is also really clearly, and the show, they're both really clearly making the argument that like, I don't know if we're going to kill people like Ellie. What are we trying to save? Um, right. And yeah, I've, I've, <laughs> I've made a terrible habit out of almost just trying to play the devil's advocate. Whenever somebody, <laughs> like when I wa- when I watched the show with my family, uh, you know, they all sort of came down pretty harsh on Joel, which allowed me to just try and make his case. And then I was talking to some other people who'd watched the show and they were like, Joel did the right thing. And I just took the other side. It's like, like, Mm -hmm. I I think that's what I love about this ending is like, I feel like I can make a pretty good case for either side. So I don't. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, the thing that's, that's completely true in the series is that Joel uh, is kind of acting for Ellie and making choices for her. Right. And I think, Mm. I think the one thing I can, I can firmly say to make myself feel better about my opinions on this ending is the choice to kind of lie to her at the end is wrong. That like is, is wrong. And, and I think, you know, the, the, the most exciting thing to me about a sequel to this game coming out uh, when it, when the second one came out, which is like, Oh my God, look at the seed they've laid here and, yeah. and got see, getting to see what that turns into is, is really exciting. And it's going to drive that storyline forward. And, and uh, no spoilers for that part two. I thought they did a fucking incredible job with that in that game. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, I think it's it's so fascinating because she's this person, Ellie's this person that is, is very driven by sur- survivor's guilt, right? Like she's lived mm. when all these other people haven't. And so she needs to believe that there was a reason for all this, that there was a reason that all these other people died to keep her alive. And, and therefore you could make an argument that like, she's not going to be of sound mind to make a choice like this. Right. I mean, not, not mentioning yeah. the fact that she's a child, like she's only mm. 14 years old. You know, we we usually try to prevent children from making certain decisions like this, um, because we say, "I don't know if you're, you're if you if you're developed enough to understand fully what you'd be giving up." And and that's I mean right that's point. a different case for each person. You know, th- that's a that's a really complicated issue as well. And and that's that's the role of the parents typically. And well, he doesn't have parents. So like, well, she does. Joel is kind of her dad. You know, so it's like. Well, and Marlene, I, I, don't, well, you know. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you're, no, you're right. And Marlene is doing the same thing, right? Where she's yeah. acting as a parent and therefore making a choice for her in a place where you kind of want to say, well, I think the right thing to do would be to give Ellie the choice in that. And then the other part of me, the parent in my head says, well, is Ellie able to make that kind of choice isn't it shouldn't shouldn't maybe there be someone else that makes that that is is better able to understand the consequence well no because she's been through, like I, so you know it's just that's yeah. that's the beauty of of uh, the way this ending is constructed i think yeah it, well yeah because i mean well who should be making the choice on whether right. to kill a 14 year old girl to potentially <laughs> save right, right. save the world uh like is that and i mean like i i think that that's a big part of it for me that I really love as well as the ambiguity around whether it would necessarily end in a cure. Like it seems right. hopeful, but technically it's not a guarantee. And I think that mm-hmm. that, that little bit of ambiguity gives Joel's side a lot of room to hang its coat because you can sort of like, because it's not a guaranteed thing that she, she would lead right. to a cure. It, it, yeah. It makes it even murkier. 
Yeah, but and then you got like you got the whole Joel side of it too, which is like, is he is he genuinely acting in Ellie's best interest, or is he acting selfishly because he can't mm. afford to lose another person again? My read's very much the latter. I I think I think Ellie would have said yes in a heartbeat. Um, mm-hmm. And my interpretation was very much that Joel, you know, disagreed. Well, and and I know we're not specifically talking about the show yet, but the, it blends so beautifully here. In the show, they chose in the moments leading up to this to, this, to show that that Joel um, almost killed himself. Uh, yeah, you, you know, which was a change from the, the story of the the game, and it's really interesting because I d- I think that does lend credence to the idea that um, that Joel is is maybe acting here specifically because he doesn't think he could survive losing another person like this like he lost his daughter Mm. this way and and he doesn't think he could survive losing another one and so he can't let that happen no matter what and so it's it's really it's really fascinating and complex and i think the game just it just builds to this moment and the thing that i love about it is you know and and i do think by the way the show does a really great job of this too is that the, the characters they meet along the way and the stories they witness and the tragedy and horribleness of of the world really serves to reinforce all the things going on around this because you're totally right this this idea Mm. of you know how (laughs) we have to sacrifice ellie to save the world well how how worth this world like yeah (laughs) if these are the people in the world do i really want to save this place um but but then you have story then you have stories like you know the two brothers and the the tragedy um Mm. with uh, what are their names why can't i remember henry and sam henry and sam thank you um and and like well you could save those people like those are people that are worth saving right yeah um and it's just i don't know man just uh, like the writing is just so on point i think at at every beat yeah well and um uh, like just to to give credit where it's due i think it was it was neil Druckmann in one of the first episodes of the of the hbo podcast made a comment about how to his mind a a big through line of of this series is they wanted to explore both the good and the monstrous sides of love so Mm -hmm. he very much Mm -hmm. sees it as a series where things are motivated by love just for good and for bad and i think like see like looking at it through that lens you can really see how yeah as you said all the stories leading up to the finale also contribute to this by the by the time you reach the end of the story you're sitting here and you're like is it a good thing to help those you love at the cost of others like i I don't know anymore because we've seen like 12 examples of where that's a great thing and then also where that's a fucking horrible thing that turns you into a literal monster exactly yeah (laughs) oh my gosh yeah i i i I love it so much and i don't want to spend the entire time talking about the story of the game because it's a video game and there's so many other things to talk about but um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know why this spoke to me in this specific kind of way, because I think the interesting thing about this game and actually it was one of the things that worried me about the show itself is that I think this is a very well told story in this video game for sure. Mm. But I also think the zombie genre has been so heavily mined yeah. in, in all forms of entertainment that I was like, is this really going to work in TV? Like, like, I mean, if you look at video games, like there's a lot of zombie games too, but how many zombie yeah. games are there out there that have like a, a good story? Like there's yeah. the resident evil games. Those, those don't, those don't count. Um, there's, there's the, the walking dead games, which are really just kind of a, a spinoff of the TV show. And, and I think I've only played yeah. the first season of that. And I thought that that was excellent storytelling. I really liked that first season. And then there's, yeah. you know, but also the, those telltale games though, they're really just, I, I always view them as interactive TV because really right, it's yeah. uh, the, at most what you're doing is button mashing every now and then it's very much yeah. a story with, with some button presses. It's like a choose your own adventure story. Yeah. Like yeah. Where you, you do get choices every so often, but they're usually binary choices. Um, mm. And Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. And so like in the world of video games, like a, a, a sharply written, well-told incisive and, and making political commentary zombie thing is just not, there's not too many examples of that, but in the world of like TV and movies, 
there's like a thousand. <laughs> there's like, there's like so many examples of this. And so I was worried. I was like, is this thing going to work? Are people going to watch this thing? And they're just going to be like, oh, we've seen this before a hundred times. And it's a very good version of this thing, but we've seen it before. Um, and mm. so I, I think it's a, to me, it's a testament to the work that the, everyone involved in the show made that that really wasn't the reaction. I mean, it was for some people, some people had that reaction. Like yeah. some people were like the walking dead exists. Why, why do we have this thing? Um, but for the most part, people were, were charmed and, and surprised by it. And that, that I think is a testament to just the, the quality of the characters and the writing in both the game and the, the TV show. Yeah. Cause I was definitely in that, in that, um, sort of oh it's another zombie thing camp when before mm. i'd really played the game and i definitely went as i started playing the game it was sort of like yeah okay we've we've got zombies and oh, we've got a character who's gonna got an immunity it might be able to create a vaccine like i've seen that before okay let's you know let's see where this goes and it, what what the game ends up being is just a really good execution of sort of those classic ideas up until the ending which completely you know tore out the um Mm -hmm. the sort of standards uh but like my impression up until halfway through the game was very much it was like oh this is just classic sort of stuff done really well and Mm -hmm. i it's one of those things where as i'm playing it thinking that i'm just like yeah but you know not everything has to be a story i've never seen before i am just very happy with a fresh solid take on something that i have kind of seen before and I think that that probably helped the last of us show overcome that feeling like it, it's also just a really good zombie thing and you know I, even in the world of film and tv i think there's a lot of bad zombie stuff out there no that's that's certainly true and i think you're right like even if the game hadn't had this this all-time banger of an ending i probably would have left it going like hey that was good and i'm glad yeah. that i got to play something that was that was pretty good and and yeah sometimes it's fine that things are just just good you know um yeah and and perhaps perhaps a little derivative but just derivative done really well um that's that's fine and and i think the like it's a small thing but honestly fungus zombies is is a fresh take on zombies which probably gets Mm -hmm. gets it a lot of leeway i think like yeah it definitely did for me when it first came out it was like well i haven't seen zombies that do exactly that before so you know that's and it's indicative of the fact that they're not just retreading old ground and it allowed them to do fun, interesting things with the the designs of them. Uh, I think yeah. just like the the like the the idea of having the runners and the clickers and and just this escalating type of infection that you get to see throughout the course of the game was just really <laughs> really clever and really fun. Um, also, I just want to say the show and the game I thought both got a lot of great uh, stuff out of introducing bloaters, which is obviously the <laughs> the really big chonky boys who have been infected. Yeah pretty much the whole time and uh like when the first one of those came out in the game i was terrified like mm-hmm. it was i was throwing everything i had at that. and uh yeah. watching it come out in the show i i kind of felt that reaction in everyone on the scene yeah no i get that for sure yeah i mean i think that's a great transition to maybe talk about the gameplay a little bit more because this is a video game and we can't just talk about story and sure. and, and I, I i do think like you know this is definitely like you, you, you get this controller in your hand and you definitely like, oh, these are the guys who made Uncharted, like the, the feel yes. of the game, the controls of the game. You get that. But then I think you quickly learn that if you play it like you play Uncharted, you're just going to die. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I do think this game really mines tension in, in a really interesting way because, you know, I, I like some of the, some of the stealth clicker sequences is some of the most tense I've ever felt playing a video game before where you're just like you the player are are holding your breath as like the character is standing still trying to make no noise as the clicker walks by (laughs) two feet from you um i i just think those sequences and and it's one of those things where i think the game does this really good job of hiding the fact that you're on the rails so often like yeah. that, that like like this this clicker is walking by at this moment not because you chose to go this way but actually the game directed you this way and like it's running a scripted event where the clicker is going to happen to walk by you right when you get to this one corner and then you get to have this really tense sequence and it's totally basically scripted i mean it's not entirely because you the player could choose in that moment to just stand up and and make a shitload of noise and it'll just come attack <laughs> you but but like the, uncharted is like the king of this and you can tell when the parts of uncharted that they they borrowed for this of like 
moments that that feel super cinematic but also feel like you are still entirely in control even if maybe you're not yeah oh and i think something that this game did do that uncharted didn't which really adds to that that tension you're talking about is you're not just fighting infected you're also fighting regular humans at times and yeah i the the biggest innovation that this made over something like uncharted i think is how the infected works so differently to human enemies like human enemies uh, work as you expect they can see you they will shoot at you um they will take cover or whatever whereas infected operate uh, you know as the zombies they're, they're clicking they're, they're listening for you rather than looking for you they behave mm-hmm. differently uh in response to most stimulus and the game does a good job of kind of alternating what you're fighting so you'll come across a pack of infected then you'll come across a pack of humans and it kind of constantly keeps you on your feet because you're having to like use different strategies and different tools to fight each mm-hmm. group of enemies. Um, and that never lets you get as comfortable with fighting them. Whereas in Uncharted, you're always fighting humans. You kind of get into a routine <laughs> of, of how you're going to use your weapons. Yeah, definitely. Um, what, uh, what difficulty did you play this on? Because for some reason, when it comes to the, like, I am not like an achievement hunting like going to play on the hardest difficulty to make myself feel good type of gamer. But yeah. for whatever reason, the naughty dog games, I always play on the max difficulty and I don't know <laughs> why I do that, but I do. Um, and so that's what I played this game on. What, what did you play it on? Um, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was called. I think it was moderate or like just the, I just played the default. I'm sure I'm sort of a recovering achievement hunter slash completionist. <laughs> um and and that got that was fine for me as a teenager and through college but it's kind of Mm -hmm. gotten in the way of me engaging with games in a fun way over the past like eight years so i'm kind of sure yeah i have to actively stop myself yeah playing playing things like the last of us on on a high difficulty would just uh, that's that's a relapse for me um there were definitely moments where i was just dying like over and over and over and over again um like it's just really hard moments where you have to stealth perfectly through the sequence and if you don't you just die yeah and i think like like i think i've played all four of the uncharted games on the toughest difficulty but i don't see myself doing it for the last of us and that's specifically because uh of the the scavenging and like the the resource management i i already get stressed enough managing resources in moderate i think i'm just like bad at dealing with that stress and i can't imagine how terrifying that is in grounded like every bullet must matter in in those tough yeah. difficulties i couldn't handle that you get like i'm six stressed just talking the... about it <laughs> you get like six bullets over the course of the entire game basically uh, yeah um, no. and, <laughs> yeah it, it's because I, I did watch you you stream it a little bit while you were because you were streaming it over on our, our twitch channel and like I, being used to the hardest difficulty I was just so shocked when you would like open a drawer in a house and there would be something in there. And I'm like, Whoa, (laughs) I never find, like I find, you know, you find one piece of tape in an entire house. It's like, sweet. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I get that. I I, like, I'm, I think it's stupid the way I play this game because I, I often just frustrate myself to no end, uh, choosing to play it on this difficulty. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know why, I don't know why I do that. I think, I, I think one thing that Naughty Dog does really well with their games that allows me to play on these crushing or grounded difficulties is the checkpoint system is really solid and the game yeah. allows you to get right back into it very, very quickly. And so when you do fuck up and die, like it doesn't feel like, oh, now I got to I don't have to I don't have to pull a Dark Souls, right? Where now I got to fucking spend the next <laughs> hour and a half to get back to the point that I was at. I was literally about to say don't get me started on Dark Souls and then you know it anyway. Um yeah, it, definitely. And and I think um it, that but the other side of that is what I often find is then I start to become a bit of a perfectionist. And this is what I worry I'd do if I played The Last of Us on Grounded is mm-hmm. if I missed any shot, I'd just instantly go and try and die. And I already do this too much on Moderate is I'm like I when I'm stressed about my resources, I get too perfectionisty and I'm like, well, that wasn't a headshot better you know restart mm-hmm. yeah um i i get that I, I i think i'm too lazy to do that but <laughs> i get i get why you would feel that way for sure yeah i do yeah i, I find it interesting the way it must go like i'm kind of interested to try grounded just to see 
because the stealth the, the thing I find interesting about stealth gameplay in general, and this game probably got me to engage with stealth more than most others do, is it, it's really hard to balance that angle of like with stealth, if you kind of stuff up once, stealth is done, that's over. You, you are now in action traditionally. Yeah. And I find that really hard to engage with because it, it kind of demands a level of perfection. Will, but also like, I don't know, like, like, so as soon as one thing goes wrong, I'm kind of like, well... I've lost. And even if I kind of get out of the scrape often, I'm like, Oh, I'd love to redo that in stealth though. Yeah, I, I get that. I think, I think the, the show actually almost makes a joke out of this in that like, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're like the, the way levels work generally is you stealth through the level until you fuck up once. And then, and then you, you action through the rest of the level for sure. I, I do think there's moments in this game that, allow you to kind of reset yourself into stealth mode like i Mm -hmm. i did i did definitely have moments where i was like stealthing through i fucked up i killed someone when i thought someone else was facing the other way and he saw me and like activated people but i was able to like get away and get into like a not not totally unexpected mode of the the ais but like at least starting to calm down mode so there were i felt like like natural reset points that you could get yourself into to where you're not like you don't just turn stealth mode off but uh you you it does change how you have to approach it yeah i think what it might have been for me is i found when i did do sections very well in stealth you generally are rewarded with more materials in the last of us like you get extra materials for stealth kills often uh yeah. and obviously you're typically using less because you don't have to shoot you know 10 bullets to hit the guys charging at you yeah um so that was i i'd start to get frustrated if i was having a run of bad stealth because i'd be like well now i got less resources out of it and i used some and so like yeah I, and i'm i this isn't such a criticism of, of this game as much as just stealth games in general i'm always like it I, i'm i wish there was a way to do a stealth game where I don't know, it, like you could just rewind time a bit or something so I could no. I could not feel like a dingus so much. I, I agree with you, actually. I, I I typically don't love stealth in my games. And I think I think actually Uncharted is a perfect example of this, honestly. As much as I love the Uncharted games, I, I'm always kind of just generally annoyed by the stealth sections yes. in those games. Um <laughs> because it's just like it's just like I know the game wants me to do stealth here. And also isn't maybe I'm remembering incorrectly but i feel like there's moments in those games where you you get to start in stealth and then you fuck up and it turns into an action game and then they'll randomly have moments where you have to do stealth and if you fuck up the game just resets itself and you have to try again there are a few of those from memory yeah and i I don't like the mixture of the two of those systems in one game um yeah but but i yeah I, i think stealth is like you know, oh, we have to have a stealth section. It feels like someone's going down a checklist a, a lot of the times. Um, <laughs> yeah, I will say the the Last of Us, or and more so the sequel, even um, is the most I've ever enjoyed doing stealth in video games because I think, mm-hmm. like as I mentioned, I have the patience of a gnat when I, it, well, just in general, <laughs> but especially when I'm playing video games. If you ask me to sit still for five seconds in a video game, it's just not happening. Um, <laughs> and so stealth, stealth generally ends for me in games because. I've taken an unnecessary risk to cut five seconds out of waiting. Uh-huh. Um, and the last of us is one of the first games ever to n- n- run for me to run into that a lot less. There were entire sections. I played this game in stealth voluntarily and the, and the resources were a part of that. I, I started to not want to lose resources, but it also, it felt yeah. satisfying. I think there's really satisfying kills uh, when you, when you do stealth kills in this game. Yeah. Um, and it also, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like the the tone of the game was forcing me to slow down. I think, it, you know, and that was the thing I ran up against when I first played it all those years ago. But once you once you kind of get on this game's wavelength and uh, are okay with moving through the world slowly and methodically and searching for all these items in drawers and stuff, you kind of stealth felt less obnoxious. Whereas, yeah, in something like Uncharted, when I spend the rest of the game in an action movie and then suddenly it's like okay now go slow part of me is like no this isn't yeah this isn't what i'm doing that that's a fantastic point i i really i really like the idea that like the 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 pace of the game the tone of the game uh you know the the kind of characterization of even the characters that you're playing kind of push mm. you towards that more stealthy 
uh, type of gameplay in a way that it doesn't feel incongruous with with everything else that you're doing. Um, I like that a lot, yeah. and and I think it I think it definitely succeeds. So yeah, the characterization is actually a really good angle. I I hadn't consciously thought about, but yeah, like Joel is. Uh, like something I was making fun of when I first started playing the game, you know, in in Uncharted or in most video games, you know, you're jumping off ledges and you're doing all these acrobatics and it's just kind of like whatever. Whereas like Joel was a video game protagonist who felt like a dude in his late forties. Like he's yeah, yeah. He, he's he's not as agile as a traditional protagonist, and I, and I really felt that, and that that did make me like I I had a few deaths early in the game because I was trying to pull giant jumps and you know launch myself off off buildings and across gaps and i had to very quickly learn that no joel does not do that he's yeah, yeah, he he, he's that. a professional but he, he's an older professional uh yeah. and also i'm protecting ellie because I, I think you know something the game can do that that the the show can't and they talked about this a lot on the podcast was um like i, I, I was joel when i played this game and there's a mm-hmm. there's a weird blend of selves that happens when you play a video game with a uh like character protagonists like joel um but i i find myself very able to sort of be like okay i am joel or in the later section of the game i am ellie and like blending their goals into my own and so i wanted to protect ellie and that meant keeping her safe which meant i couldn't just charge in as often because that might hurt ellie yeah no that's a great point and and i think it is one of the th- the things that this game really succeeds at it, making you feel like you have that responsibility to this uh, you know npc character that's following you around while also not doing the thing that a lot of games are notorious for doing is is making that npc character just annoying as shit to where you actually <laughs> you actually grow to resent them cuz they're fucking with your game like that would have been devastating for this game right like if yeah. if if by the end of your game you're just like oh god damn it ellie stop it and and like you're just <laughs> frustrated by her ai and just the the she's making the game more difficult for you i never felt that playing this game even even no. in the the 30 moments where i could i could very easily swim across this this little water spot but i have to find a, a wooden plank for her to sit, <laughs> stand on because she can't swim like even in those moments like i did feel a little bit of annoyance but that was appropriate because joel was a little bit annoyed yes. too right <laughs> um and and so yeah she never becomes a hindrance to the point where it's hurting your enjoyment of the gameplay sections of the game yeah and a little bit of that is because it's clearly programmed so that she can't really set enemies off on her own because there were definitely moments where like ellie would basically bump into a clicker and just it would just keep (laughs) keep doing its thing and i'm like okay well i mean you know that wasn't realistic but i'd be even madder (laughs) Yeah, but I'd be even madder if the clicker had been set off by Ellie when it wasn't anything I did. Like, yeah, so yeah. sort of, I I think they made the right choice. Um, yeah, it makes you wonder if there was an earlier version of the game in which that scripting wasn't in it yet, and they like were play testing it, and people were just like furious, and they're just yeah. like, no, we have to change this. Like, I think the only thing that made me really dislike Ellie a lot of the time was that. Uh, often in my playthrough, I made the same jokes as her at the same time, like almost <laughs> word for word. So it felt like the game was kind of launching an attack on my sense of humor that it's like, hey, here's this dorky 14 year old who's an idiot and you keep saying the same things as her. So what is that saying about you? Um, so I, I wasn't a fan of that aspect of the game, that it was specifically targeted at me. Um, but aside from that, she was great. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad you're. You're basically just a 14 year old girl is what we've learned today. I know it was, it, 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 yeah, it was, it was very confronting constantly making the exact same jokes as a, that's great. That's great. Um, okay. Well, we've been talking for this for a while and I, I'm kind of anxious to get to the TV show itself, although we've kind of sprinkled it in. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to say about the video game specifically? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. I, 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 I guess I'm, very interested to talk about some of the changes, which is kind of in the middle. Sure. Like, uh, yeah, something I, I really found fascinating here was watch. This is one of my first times really engaging with a game story and then seeing it adapted very quickly and like noticing all the little changes and really kind of, especially th- thanks to that podcast again, I'm going to keep plugging that apparently. Um, <laughs> getting a sense for why those changes happened. I, I loved sort of getting that insight into how 
how the mediums led to did changes between the story and what that meant. I found that fascinating. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I definitely want to talk about that too. And I think you've played the game more recently than I have. So I think you're definitely more plugged into those changes than I am. Some of them I like had to be reminded of um, when sure. uh, I, I was like reading stuff and listening to stuff about the, the show. But I, I guess overall, before we dive into those details, what did you think of the show? Was it successful in, in doing what it wanted to do? Yeah, I, I I definitely really really loved it. Um, mm-hmm. I, I've I've tried to sit with the you know probably unfair but simple question of do I think the game or the TV show is better? Mm-hmm. You know, dealer's choice what you define better as I guess. Um, sure. And I, I I don't like I really do keep coming down on the idea that I think they each have their own strengths and and for one of a better word weaknesses and. Mm-hmm. I I don't know which I would say is the definitive experience. Perhaps the game, but maybe I'm biased. Yeah, I I would say I still think the game is the definitive experience, but I'm I'm very grateful for the TV show because like I, I think a perfect example of this for me is I really love this story and I really wanted my wife to experience it. And yeah. I tried to get her to play this video game and she just can't. Um she's just like she's not she really was not a video game person at all as a kid. And like the, the things we take for granted playing video games, like, like just the idea of a dual stick setup where one stick is controlling the movement of the character and the other stick is controlling the camera. Like, that's just a thing that like her brain can't immediately grab, grab onto. And it was going to take hours and hours and hours for her to get used to that kind of camera movement. Whereas for me, I can just do it instantly. And so she just kind of bounced off this game. And I was like, I was like, really, I was like, but the story is so good. And I'm like, (laughs) I'm not going to sit you in front of YouTube and just have you watch 12 hours of YouTube videos playing the story. And so like this show existing got me to finally be like, look, here's this thing I love. And I talk to you about all the time, but you've never got to experience. Now you get to just sit on a couch and experience it. Um, and, And it's not the same. It's not. And like you said, I don't think it's the definitive experience, but it's, it's close enough to where I feel like, Oh, I, I, I don't, I don't feel bad that, that my wife will never get to experience this story now. Yeah. And and I felt because the, the concept of what, should an adaptation do what is an adaptation for has been something i feel like i've been talking about a lot in the past year just Mm -hmm. like to to friends and family and stuff because i I feel like last year for some reason that sort of discourse really went into overdrive and we had stuff like the uh, the amazon water the rings show or Mm -hmm. uh the Mm -hmm. wheel of time and and a bunch of others it it, uh or even like again that mario movie is a really interesting case because it's not like mario is story heavy so like (laughs) that movie is going to be very different to the games because it's, yeah. it has a story. Um, and like, I guess you see a lot of talk online. Something that really irritates me is, is like criticisms of an adaptation, including the last of us where it's like, Oh, this was a bad adaptation because look, this scene is different now. And yeah. a lot of people seem to just want a one-to-one mapping, which to me, I'm like, well, then why, why are we bothering? And the only answer yeah. to that is, as you said, because some mediums are more accessible to people than others. Um, but yeah, like the, this, I, I guess has been a thought that that's been sitting a lot in my head over the past year of like, what, what should an adaptation or, you know, it's going to be a different answer for different people. Like, yeah. What, what are adaptations for? What are they doing? And I think yeah. that's, that's probably one of the biggest ones is taking something that you might, that might not be accessible to some people and making it so. That's definitely one of the pieces of it. This is I'm so glad you you said this because this is one of like my favorite ongoing questions ever because I I, and I it's one of those ones that I know I will never have a definitive answer for. But like it is something I I think about and talk about all the time. You know, we just on Kingslingers finished up with uh, rewatching Kubrick's The Shining after we finished reading the book and it was Matt's first time reading the book. And so it was his first time revisiting that that movie uh, with the knowledge of what happens in the book in mind. And, and that is one of those things where the adaptation is, is notoriously completely different from the novel. Mm. And like, you know, there's a lot of times where people, you know, get to say like, it's a really good movie, but it's a bad adaptation. And, and, and it's not that I'm disagreeing with that sentiment, but I'm just like, well, what does it mean to be a good adaptation? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Because, yeah, like it it, does it change a lot of the story? Yes. Um, But like to me, the the fascination that I have with adaptation 
is you get to see someone else's take on the same material. So like, you know, Mm. Craig Mazin, who is the showrunner for this TV show, um, did not create the last of us. He is, is someone that that brings his own unique experiences to this stuff. And he is going to see it in a different way than Neil Druckmann is going to see it. Right. And, and even, even, even Neil Druckmann himself, years have gone by since the first time he created this thing. And so he has had life experiences since he finished making this thing that might affect how he looks at these things. And so getting to see, so like the, the differences to me are actually like the, the, the sweet spot, like the, like seeing Mm, how you can have two, two different people, or maybe even the same person at two different points in their life, look at the same material and come to a different conclusion with it or, or, or choose a different angle to look at it or change it in a way that says, well, I, I, when I looked at it this time, I was thinking more about this. I don't know. That to me is super fascinating. Yeah. And we haven't talked about Bill and Frank yet, but that, that feels like the obvious first example to zoom in on for the last of us, because obviously huge change there and but like again i think the tv show in in this case i think got to do so much more with it anyway i would argue the tv show did this part of the story quote unquote better because it had Mm -hmm. the freedom to because you know it wasn't limited to joel and ellie's perspective they got to actually zoom in on who bill and frank were yeah um whereas the game just kind of gets to show you a old grizzled bill who's just recently lost frank um or (laughs) wounds he has as you as you play the game with him Mm -hmm. um and the it it didn't get to build well particularly frank but also bill out to the same depth as the show was able to and that was like that was a situation where yeah they're sitting down to do the adaptation They, they get to take a step back and sort of like well what was the purpose of this part of the story and can yeah. we do more with that now or can we do less with it or, or what what do we do with it in this new medium? And like that, that's a really interesting creative process uh, to me. I, I agree. And and I, I love that episode. I think that, you know, I, I was enjoying the show a lot until episode three and that episode just like kicked the shit out of me. And it's just mm. one of those like all time prestige TV, like we're going to do a one off thing that's just going to gut you emotionally and it's just going to be fantastically well told. But it is it is really interesting because you're absolutely right in the game. For those that haven't played the game and are listening to this in the game, Bill is, you know, a guy you come across uh, as you're trying to escape um, and and B- Bill is not with Frank. And when you're with Bill, like you I think you walk into a house and you see a corpse like hanging from the ceiling and we learn that this is Frank and he's killed he's killed himself and i think he's like left a note for bill that basically is just like fuck off i hate you and it's yeah. like like and so you see their relationship actually kind of fractured and destroyed um that, that these are two people that obviously you know cared for each other at some point but at, at, at some other point their relationship kind of was splintered and 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 destroyed and and frank left him and then left him to his death unbeknownst to him and then In this show, they said, "Okay, that served a purpose there. But what if we did something different with it? And and what they chose to do is, you know, what you talked about, that that this is, you know, a reflection on like the the good and the monstrous sides of love. What they chose to do with Bill and Frank was was say, okay, let's use them as one of the examples of of (laughs) the, the power of love. Uh, I'm I'm laughing to myself as I say that because it's a Huey (laughs) Lewis and the news song. But um, I think that's such an interesting choice because in the game, Bill is kind of like can kind of serve as like a warning, you know, of if you don't like the the failure in their relationship that eventually leads to, to Frank's death was was at least we're led to believe partially because Bill's stubborn refusal to change or adapt or, you know, or or evolve as a human being. And yeah, so that 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 becomes a, a a a warning post actually and in the the show it's not that that doesn't exist because we see bill at the beginning of the show as this like person who was stubbornly refusing to change and then frank kind of wears him down over time <laughs> um and it's just it is a really fascinating choice there to say no no let's let's use them for an example of of good yeah um i i think there are a number of moments there where as they've fleshed out some of these stories of characters from from the game to the show like it it almost parallels 
Joel's journey even more. Like the the show yeah, very yeah. sort of clearly lays out the message to to the audience and to Joel that like if you don't figure out how to get close to people again, mm-hmm. you've wasted your life. You're not living. You're already dead. Um, yeah. And and that you know that is sort of the message of Bill in the game as well. But the 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 show just tells it in a, in a not more upbeat way. Um, but like the other the other bit that really jumped out to me is uh, as a difference was there's a bit where Henry, um, talking about his younger brother Sam, mentions in the show that he sold out. Um, I've forgotten the name of the guy who was leading the revolution. Yeah, um, the, the liberation against Fedra, yeah. Yeah, uh, and he sold them out to Fedra in order to save Sam, his younger brother, and he sort of outright says, I'm the villain, I did the wrong thing, but I did it for my brother. And very, very overtly sort of laying seeds for Joel's decision at the end of the show. <laughs> um, yeah, this was definitely one of those moments where I was like watching my wife as she reacted to this. I'm like, so what do you think of the yeah. decision to prioritize <laughs> to the obvious. loved one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, whereas like, you know, they obviously they didn't get quite that over in, in the game because it, it didn't have the the room to really grow Henry Henry and Sam's backstory in that way. Mm-hmm. And, um I so I, I sort of really liked seeing how as they expanded these um NPCs from the game story, how much they, they use that as a way to kind of really echo what the show was talking about. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I love the Henry Sam stuff and, and the Henry Sam stuff, I think, really, you know, conflicts really nicely with the why am I forgetting the, her name? I'm so bad with names, Elliot. Jesus. Um, yeah. The the, the I know leader Melanie of the, Lins- Linsky's Mel- who plays her. Like, yeah. I can't but, tell you what the character's name is. <laughs> I should I should have uh, Kathleen is, is the name of the character. Yes. And, and I, th- I thought this was really fascinating too, because yeah, you have the, this, this guy who, you know, gives up this rebellion leader for his brother, um, for love, you know, for, for, to, for, to, to care for his brother. And then you have Melanie Linsky's character who is, is in her mind, you know, doing the same thing, right. Where she's seeking yeah. revenge and justice for her loved one that took care of her. And, and yeah, I, I think it's such a great contrast. And then you have Joel kind of in the middle of this whole thing, you know, in this slowly, you know, uh, blooming relationship he has with ellie and it's the 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 lack of clarity here i think is what makes it wonderful (laughs) because like well i mean you're just kind of like well yeah i think henry did the right thing his brother was sick and dying what was he supposed to do well but he sold out and then like you see the consequences of those actions with with melanie linsky's character and then you see how she takes that same central idea and drives it to the point of of becoming a monster and it and it destroys her and then it's just like, ah, oh, I, I, I don't, I don't have, I don't <laughs> have any, I don't have an easy like place to store this in my, in my morality folder, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think that is when shows like this and stories like this are operating at their best it, is that it, they, they are kind of cleverly dodging your ability to just say, okay, well, at the end of this episode, I know you were clearly right and you were clearly yeah. wrong. And I feel great about this. And I feel not so like they, they, they force you into this mode where you can't make those decisions. And I do think that this show primed the audience for this ending in a way that maybe the game didn't quite accomplish as well, yeah. um, that they laid the seeds for it maybe not literally but at least emotionally and and metaphorically in a way that the the game didn't yeah 100 percent. and like like because you know we're talking about kathleen here she wasn't a character in the game like that this no, was not yeah. in the game it was just a kind of faceless horde of uh you know crazy people who'd taken over a, a city from fedra uh, mm-hmm. And then you just ran into Henry and Sam, who are from a different group outside the city, and you just kind of teamed up with them. Whereas, yeah, they they added this entire plot line of of kind of giving us actual faces to this revolution. I, I feel like justifying the resolu- the revolution a lot more. I actually felt like in the the show did a better job of saying Fedra here really sucked, and yeah. these guys were seemingly right to get rid of them. Um, it was, and then it was just like the the only real issue with with Kathleen was this obsession with killing Henry and Sam. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But like none of that was in the game, and I thought it like yeah added added a lot to to the show for sure. 
Yeah. No, you you raise an interesting point that the show does a lot more work to make you understand that Fedra sucks. I'm wondering what you feel about the Fireflies uh, in in the show's version of the world, because I, I do think the show actually does work to make you kind of dislike the Fireflies a bit too. Um, and I don't remember having that strong of a, f- a reaction to the Fireflies when I first played the game, but I'm thinking specifically of the the flashback sequence in the mall that is the DLC of the game, Ellie's backstory, her, that portion, yeah. where the the show kind of makes it seem like the Fireflies have recruited a child soldier, equipped her with dynamite, and sent her <laughs> into enemy lines. And I'm like, I don't know how I feel about this, actually. Like, even if Fedra yeah. definitely super sucks, I don't know how I feel about Riley like going to blow up civilian uh buildings to make a point against fedra yeah i i definitely remember like kind of flip-flopping in the game where i think like i started the game and joel much like he is in the show is instantly kind of very dismissive of the whole firefly agenda like joel's just looking out for him and his Mm -hmm. and he doesn't really engage with the idea of restoring democracy and having a good cause and so i was sort of instinctively like oh okay no no these are actually the noble freedom fighters and we'll get there eventually, but they are the good guys. And then, obviously, you sort of make it to the to the end of the game, and the Fireflies make this choice to yeah. to kill Ellie, and that kind of made me go a bit more like, oh, okay, that's awfully, you know, utilitarian and Fedra of you to um, yeah mm-hmm. kind of, kind of do kind of do so. So that I, I kind of softened on them a bit, and then obviously Joel Joel went on his massacre, and I was like, well, now I can't really see them as the baddies either. <laughs> um yeah so yeah like i kind of left the game very much kind of flip-flopping whereas i I, in the show i thought the show seemed to think the fireflies and fedra both sucked the whole the whole time it's more the vibe i I got but yeah um i I can't tell if i if that's because i was coming into it prepared with the game knowledge maybe that's fair no that's fair um i don't know i don't know i just like i was yeah like i don't there there were beats in the show that i this is an interesting one actually there, there is a, like two back to back episodes, the Ellie flashback episode and then the David episode where two different people, two different authority figures. One is a federal officer. The other is David, like like are seemingly like enamored by Ellie. Um, yeah. In David's case, it's like super creepy. And there's a there's <laughs> yeah. a basically a, there's basically a line they both repeat, which is like the fact that she's like a, a natural leader and. I, I, f- I found this really, really interesting because like I like Ellie as a character a lot. And I think Bella Ramsey does a fantastic job portraying her in this in the show. But I don't I don't think I ever really saw a moment in the TV show where I said like, oh, she's going to be a great leader someday. And it's so <laughs> weird. Have these two central authority figures like basically appealing to her via this this appeal to oh you're gonna be you're gonna be somebody one day and, and so we want you to to be in the leadership core and and it, it forced me to just basically decide that these people were just lying to her or maybe not even lying to her but but trying to manipulate her by dangling power in front of her because it just it was so it was such a, a weird statement to say because again i love ellie when has she led anyone <laughs> <laughs> yeah Oh uh, yeah, no. She spends uh, most of the time we're with her in the show, uh, very much being a follower. Uh, yeah, yeah, like a, an active follower. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I I definitely agree. And, and I mean, I guess because that Ellie flashback episode where she's at Fedra at the start of it was definitely in the show, kind of the 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 only time I felt they really did much with Fedra. Like, and I. I Mm-hmm. I flip popped a bit because I, I definitely saw other people criticizing this a bit more in the show, like, especially on Twitter. Um, it, it, like the the Fedra Firefly conflict was very much in the background of the show. Like we we see Fedra be bad in generic US city that Henry, Sam, and Kathleen were from. Um, mm-hmm. But like as you as you mentioned, like uh, you know that episode with David episode eight like just doesn't have fedra or the fireflies in it that's the episode preceding the finale um and i I think i had to remind one or two members of my family exactly who marlene was because you you only see her in the first and in the last episode really yeah no that's true Um, that's true 
and and so I, I like and and this applies to the game to an extent but yeah most of the show I, I think there was a struggle there with like deciding how the firefly fedra conflict how much it was in the background versus the driving force in the world yeah i i really like i don't know this is my broad complaint about this show that i did enjoy quite a bit is that mm. i think it's actually kind of structurally weird um and, and i think the show succeeds in the moment to moment bits like the the moments of characterization the the relationships between the characters that the actors pull off really really well um, yeah you know individual episodes like episode three is an all-timer i also i also really love episode five it's the the conclusion mm. of the kansas city arc i think that's a really really good one as well and then of course the the finale but like i i think like the the intra episode structure of the season felt a little weird to me where it, it felt we move very quickly in some places, move very slowly in other places. Um, and, and then like the, the, like I, I thought the Ellie flashback episode was great. I also couldn't help, but be like, this is a weird place to put this. Yeah. I had in, the same the, thought. And, um, and then I was thinking like, well, well, where else would they put it though? Like if they yeah, wanted to put yeah. it in the show, like where, like it, it's, it's a weird place structurally to put it, but perhaps it's the only place you could put it. Yeah. Cause they may like, I, I heard the creators make the case where they basically said like, they didn't want to have that content early in the show because they thought an important part of the Joel Ellie dynamic is us kind of learning about Ellie and who she is alongside Joel. And they didn't want us coming in with that preconception of her. And I completely agree with that. I think it would have yeah. sort of fundamentally changed how the audience interacted with Ellie if they'd included much of that at the start. Um, Agreed. So I don't, yeah, I, I feel like I'd be one of those people. It's like, look, I don't have a better idea, but it felt weird. <laughs> um, like in the, in the game, they kind of get off easy because it's, because it's a DLC that you play after the main game. It kind of right. just, you, you you play the main game and then you kind of play this extra level which sort of tells you hey this is happening you know there's there's bits of it that happen while ellie is taking care of joel or after he's been shot or mm -hmm. stabbed um and then there's also the flashback parts whereas in the show yeah they just kind of chucked in and i especially found watching it week to week what happened was then we came into episode eight and joel was still stabbed and my one of my parents was like wait what happened to joel again like <laughs> you know just just because we kind of had a week off and it only focused on ellie they sort of forgot exactly how joel had gotten stabbed um and so it kind of, it kind yeah. of was an interesting sort of break in the flow that it, yeah it, like it, again i don't i don't have a solution it just it, it didn't quite come together it's absolutely one of those things where you're like damned if you do and you're damned if you don't like this is the yeah. struggle of writing sometimes in that just like you want to convey this information there and you try to do it as best as you possibly can. Because I actually think the, the, the solution they came up with, which is that Ellie is like about to walk out the door and abandon Joel and give up, leave him for dead. And then she has this flashback to this moment where Riley like motivated mm. her to keep going no matter what. And, and, and I think that ties that flashback to the current moment as good as you possibly could. But yeah, there is there is some some structural funniness with the idea that we kind of just we leave Joel in this dire situation where we don't know if he's going to live or die. And then we just say, OK, pause. We're going to do this thing over here for an episode and then come back to that that later. Um, and then also another effect of it is we have Joel like make a, a an almost video game speed recovery um, in, the, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the episode following it. We're like she shoots some antibiotics directly into his wound, which <laughs> that made me cringe. But then like basically just, just because of the nature of the show and, and, and how it wants to move and, and when it wants to move and, and the decision to say, we're only going to spend one episode in this camp uh, with, in the David camp, we're only going to do one episode here. You, you have to have Joel like make a, a very speedy recovery in that or even yeah. if it wasn't or even if it wasn't like literally within the world of the story a speedy recovery even if it was over the course of of days that doesn't really translate when it's over the course of 15 minutes of of 
uh, playtime in the in the the show. And it's these it's these little things, these little moments that like I completely understand the struggle with it, and and it it, it is a yeah. perfect testament to how fucking hard it is to write a good story. But it just it, it, it there were just little moments like that, and even. I think it's in the episode. It's in the episode where Joel gets hurt, where the beginning of the episode is this montage of them traveling. Then they get uh, to um, uh, new new Jackson. Is that the name of the, or is it just yeah. Jackson? Um, they get Jackson. to Jackson and then they do a little bit there. And then you think the, sh- the episode's about to end, but then they, we do another travel montage in the same 45 minute episode. Yeah. And I'm just like, Oh, this is just like structurally just a little bit weird. In, in the choices they made. I don't know. Am I totally off base here? No, I had the same thought. When that episode ended, I just walked away with the impression that they kind of had two half episode. Like they looked at both these ideas and they're like, well, neither one's worth a whole episode, but we mm-hmm. want to do them both. So let's just kind of chop the episode in half. And it, yeah, it led yeah. to this really weird episode structure. Yeah, I, I, I felt the same thing. It was like, okay, oh, we're leaving Jackson. Uh, oh, okay, we're going to end with the stabbing, I, I guess. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's just I think I think what it is is like and this is one of the other big complaints I saw about the show is when you carve out every moment of of, you know, you, the character holding a controller in your hand, hacking your way through people and zombies. You can't like you can't do that in the show every time. Right. Like you can't just constantly have those sequences in the show. So you have to carve them out. And when you carve all that stuff out, what you're left with is 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 the cutscenes where people don't actually spend too much time in the story beats in the places they're going. Um, and yeah, I, I, I do, I do also feel it. And this is, I don't know if this is entirely in my head. I feel like this show is in some ways a reaction to some of the critiques of shows like the walking dead where, and I, I dropped off of that show a long time before it ended. Same. So I don't even, I don't even know what happened in the last few I seasons. Think it's still going is it jesus in its final (laughs) season i think but i think it's still on yeah but um one of the complaints i had and one of the complaints the most popular complaints i saw about that show is is they would get to like a place and the the characters would just sit in that place like the prison they just sat there the farm they just sat there and part of that is just like trying to save money in in tv production right because it's really expensive (laughs) to build locations and like felt like it's just super expensive but it felt to me at times like this was a show that was like actively trying to avoid that critique by just like we're gonna move we're like we're we're in david's camp but we're in this camp for for 30 minutes and then we're moving on to something else we're moving it just it felt i I, like it i was i was content with all the moments and this character beats and everything and the development but like the it felt like the show was sprinting at times i don't know yeah i i i do think that this is largely just sort of artifacts of trying to take a, a game story and make it a tv show because those those two mediums are paced very differently like uh something i kept running into in in the game the game is divided up into chapters and i think they're like i want to say 14 or so chapters Mm -hmm. um but chapter four took me like two and a half or three hours whereas some of some of the other chapters were like 20 minutes um yeah yeah uh, so it was much more like a book where it was just like, okay, like, like you know, a, a chapter in the classical sense, which is, you know, this is a sort of arbitrary division that I'm making based on all sorts of variables or whatever. Whereas a show, e- even one of these HBO shows kind of has to s- stick w- to a general runtime. And so like, mm-hmm. a- a- and also have a, a bit more of a satisfying, I guess with chapters, they don't necessarily have to be a completely neat division between the two. Um whereas episodes kind of do because i'm going to put it down for a week um sure so yeah like i have to imagine it's just a bit of an artifact of taking a game's plot which is f- just paced fundamentally differently and, and sticking yeah. it into a tv show yeah definitely and and this is this is also why you know there's just not too many zombies in the show actually <laughs> like yeah. we, we get we get a couple moments uh here and there and and this is one of those things that I see these complaints of people talking online is like, well, there's no zombies in the zombie show. And I have to be like, I don't know if you really <laughs> want that, though. Like, like if, if they just started putting more action set pieces with with them fighting clickers, like, I think you would tire of it eventually, actually. Yeah, I 
I just saw John Wick 4 two days ago. Okay. And I, I wanted to bring that up here because that felt like I was watching a Last of Us movie, but only the combat parts. Okay. Because there you are, have to you have to explain yeah. what that means. There are multiple scenes in John Wick 4 where John Wick kills about six waves of enemies in the same room to the point where it would actually kind of start to get a bit boring and feel ridiculous to me. So I, wait, there, there was like one scene where he was in this sort of museum-y room with a bunch of glass panels and and three guys come in shooting at him and he takes them out. And then as soon as he's done, four more guys came in. He kills them. Three other new guys come in. And that happens at least five times before then like the evil assassin guy who who's like the main baddie of the movie comes in and then they have an even bigger fight in that room but like that that felt like what playing the last of us or or uncharted (laughs) is more like where it was like okay here's this room and i clear some enemies and oh no a hole's open in the roof and more enemies are pouring in and like the you know the last of us show wasn't like that and john wick 4 was and watching john wick 4 i was kind of like god the last of us made the right decision because (laughs) i uh there's I guess mild spoilers for John Wick 4 here, but there's a bit where he has to climb a big staircase uh, in France and it's like 200 steps or something and he's fighting guys the whole way up and they keep coming in from the sides every time he kills all the ones who are on the scene. And then he gets to the top. Someone knocks him right back down to the bottom and we watch him climb the whole staircase again, <laughs> fighting even more guys on it on the second trip. Yeah. And... Like that's the sort of thing I think I've only ever seen before in a video game and watching it in a movie. I was like, this has gone for so long. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, I haven't seen John Wick 4 yet, but I, I've i seen the other three and I, I do feel like that series is getting a little bit diminishing returns with its action <laughs> sequences. Like I, I, I enjoy them, but yeah, there's, there's moments where you're like, okay, we, we kind of, we kind of get this. And I think the last of us does a really good job with this actually, because you know, you have the sequence where they're, they're sneaking through uh, the museum uh, and they're sneaking by the clickers. And I think that as we talked about earlier, I think that perfect perfectly captures what it felt like to play the game and sneak by clickers and then have it all go to shit and, and turn into like a running for your life sequence. I think that perfectly captures that. And then, and then, you know, you have the sequence, um, with the the zombies where the truck falls into the pit and then like they just come pouring out of it and this this wonderful panic sequence and that (laughs) really really works too like i I loved everything about that i think i love the detail of it like show like the way the show shows us how joel and ellie are starting to communicate and get in sync we're like you know she's like gesturing to him like wordlessly gesturing to him where she wants to go and he's backing her up and it's just this really great way of showing the the deepening of their relationship and also the action's really good and fun and i was like yeah it it brought those parts into the show in a way that it felt like you like it felt like it was being true to the game and i don't i don't i don't look i look at that and like i don't know if i needed more than that like i don't know if i need another sequence of us sneaking by clickers again um it's, yeah you know i don't know no i agree because like the last of us action scenes are never going to be as much just like machine guns and zombies and, and jumping and, and and stuff and so like they are all kind of uh, that more slow paced tension and i don't know how, so i don't know how mm-hmm. much a dozen more would have, would have serviced yeah. anything really and, um, and ultimately ultimately it's a it's a show about the characters right like this is this is what yeah. the show cares about more than you know, being chased by clickers, it, it's the characters and the action serves that portion of the story really well in the moments that they do have the zombie stuff. Um, yeah. And I mean, that, that character drivenness was what won me on the game more than the gameplay. Like it, yeah. at first I was definitely just doing the gameplay because I did manage to get invested into the story, which was through the characters more than anything mm-hmm. else. Like, uh, yeah, especially early in the game, I was like, okay, Ellie's immune. Like that, that felt like a you know pretty traditional zombie story like it wasn't yeah. interesting but then it was like yeah okay i really care about ellie and joel and i want to see what they are and then i started to get into the gameplay because i had to get good at it to see the rest of the story <laughs> um and, and actually, so, something that is more game oriented that, that i forgot to talk about and I, I wish i had brought up when you asked was um the, the, so when joel gets stabbed or or impaled as he is in the game um 
this is the point in the game where you switch to playing as Ellie mm-hmm. and you uh, lose all of your upgrades because as you play through the game, basically through a mixture of drugs and uh, also <laughs> like a nail file, um, you can upgrade Joel and your weapons as you go through the game uh, and it makes things easier. Like there's less uh, errors in your aiming as Joel gets better. Uh, mm. and stuff like that and they take that all away when you switch to ellie who has even more a- issues aiming and dealing with recoil and breathing as she's looking down the scope and stuff um and i really loved that as a way to make the like part of the game hard like it, it felt really fun because it was very believable like it wasn't immersion breaky at all it didn't feel cheap to take away all my upgrades but suddenly i was ellie and i i had none of these new easier ability uh, abilities I'd, that made the game easier and was suddenly i felt like i was in the deep end and that that transition to being ellie we, I, I lose all my upgrades and say so i felt like i'd gone from being a 40 year old guy to a 14 year old girl i was no longer able to defend myself and that was terrifying yeah, yeah you're right it's great and i think it serves the the story really well too because you get to be like for a brief moment like oh this is what it's like to live as ellie in this world like this is yeah. what it feels like because yeah by that time in the game you've got enough upgrades you've gotten kind of used to the combat and the gameplay and you're getting you know pretty good at the game right where, where you're able to yeah. kind of take down the things that the game is throwing at you pretty effectively and then suddenly this and it's like oh this is what it must be like to be this girl this is awful this is terrifying um and then she has to go up against david which is one of the yeah. most horrifying <laughs> parts of the story uh, in both both stories they both yes <laughs> i i think the show did a did a great job with the david mm. stuff yeah i and it, like, again the added backstory they were able to give david in the show i think really enhanced his creep factor um yeah because because the religious stuff was all added in the show right he was not like a religious leader in the game he was just a cannibal yeah. prick, right? I, I certainly missed all the religious stuff if it was there. Um, like if, if it was there, it was only in little background details and collectibles mm-hmm. that I didn't notice. Um, yeah, but I, I, I guess the other part as well, I, I think from a gameplay perspective, it's really fun because, um, it, yeah, like it elevated the difficulty. Like as you said, it, it kind of takes away all the comforts you have. And, and so not only are you getting a better insight into Ellie and stuff, but also it just made the game harder and towards the end of the game that's that's what you yeah. want and i think the last of us is not a game with many like traditional boss battles like there's sort of sure the first time a bloater came came up it felt like a boss but then later on they start to just kind of be hard enemies um whereas that that david boss fight is is one of the most boss fightiest parts of the game and it's because the, the game sort of takes everything away from you, makes you a little girl going up against a grown man with just like, oh, I think you only have a little knife at this point. And it's like, well, yeah. best of luck. Um, and that was that was so much more of an interesting way to do a boss battle than just, oh, he's a more bigger zombie. It's a hard fucking fight, man. It's a hard fight, yeah. especially on the super hard difficulty. I can't tell you how many times where like I got into a position where I was like, oh, man. I got him. He's walking that way. I can sneak up behind him and I go to like rush up behind him and then step on some glass. <laughs> and then he immediately turns around. And you're just like, fuck. <laughs> I, yeah, I was, uh, I felt like I was genuinely running for my life for parts of it. Like when you're trying mm-hmm. to hide from him, is this searching for you? I was yeah. genuinely scared. Uh, it was great. Yeah. I yeah. think cause and, yeah. And- uh, oh, sorry. I just wanted to call out again, the, there's a sort of lack of fun. I, I love the way the game inverts the concept of a final boss because really the the final boss in this game is that part we've already talked about, which is where the game finally gives you an assault rifle and says, go kill everyone in the hospital. Yeah. Um, and, and it's that, kind of designed to be easy, right? Because of that, yeah. that assault rifle. Like, I, I don't think that's supposed to be a challenging mm. gameplay moment, which is just a great inversion on like anything a video game you would, you would think would do. Yeah, and it makes that it, it it leaves you the room to sort of be because I I think I paused as I was doing it because it was sort of like I'm doing it and I'm just mowing down all these guys I'm like wow this is a very easy end game and then me thinking that then makes me wonder well why and then that made me start thinking about what I was doing more because I think something the game struggled with a bit more than the show was um like video games kind of train you not to worry that much about who you're killing you know they're the baddies mm-hmm. that. NPCs they don't matter um 
And so the ending kind of had to go out of its way. Give, give me like a more horrifying weapon, make it weirdly easy and make me actually question why am I killing? Because that's not a question yeah. we're used to considering in a game. Mm-hmm. And didn't um, the, sh- the episode of the show I watched was a few weeks ago now, but didn't um, the, f- the finale of the show kind of go into first person a little bit with when yeah. Joel was hunting through it? It definitely, and, it, and, and third person a bit. Like there were a number of times we were looking right over his shoulder as he was shooting yeah, people. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think the show did go a little bit harder in playing up the monstrosity of what Joel was doing in a way where I, I got the vibe that may have been a little bit of a correction because I think there were probably people who played the game and didn't really engage with the ending as much as they would have liked. And I felt like maybe mm-hmm. the show tried to step it up a notch for people who didn't get it the first time sure sure yeah like like i I don't think i don't think any person should walk away from this ending show or game and be like well joel was definitely a hundred percent right or definitely a hundred percent wrong (laughs) like i i think if you walk away from this with that opinion like i'm not going to tell someone they're 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 watching something wrong but i just feel like you weren't fully engaging with what the material was trying to tell you yeah yeah i i yeah i don't know so that 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 seems like somebody who's far too sure in their ethical model for me yeah Yeah, (laughs) definitely um and and the show's trying to challenge that so i think you should you should kind of meet it halfway there and be like Mm. well i mean you you might support his idea that he's going to protect his daughter no matter what like i can get behind that but is this the right way to do it yeah yeah (laughs) yeah so i don't know um i I thought i thought the ending was really effective in in communicating the the horror of it for sure um and and i agree Mm. i agree with you generally i think this is something that this this game does struggle with and this the second game struggles with as well is the this idea that you are you do kill a, a lot of people you're like if this game was real life you would be like one of the biggest mass murderers in the history of the planet um (laughs) and and like it wants you to feel those things but like it it also it also is a game like like one of the most effective ways of dealing with two enemies in this game is you sneak up behind one hold a gun to his head and tell the guy standing next to him to drop his gun and then you wait for him to do that, and then you shoot both of them and kill them. <laughs> and just yeah, like, yeah. That is that is just a remarkably <laughs> effective way of dealing with a pair of enemies in the game, and and it's also heartless and and monstrous and terrible. And like, I do I over the course of these two games, I've probably done it a hundred times. Yeah. And so it does. There is there is kind of a um a loss of the impact of that uh at times and i think you know again no spoilers for the second game but i think the second game was designed with that truth in mind and it it attacks you there a little bit in in really fun ways and maybe one day we'll have a conversation about that but um i did feel in this game that is a little lost and maybe that's why in the in the show they really wanted to to push that button down really hard yeah uh, to, to to make it to make it very clear that you're probably not supposed to feel good about what's happening on the screen right now. Yeah. It, it, Cause you're right. Like I suppose if we lived in a world where the last of us show had preserved like all the action from the game, which would be an insane thing to do. But mm-hmm. by that point we would have watched Joel kill hundreds of people <laughs> and infected. Yeah. And it would be yeah. like, it would have been like, well, yeah. I mean, what's another hospital of fireflies, right? Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so like I think the show had the advantage of having Joel only kill a couple of people to that point. Yeah. Um probably probably like ten or so. And like yeah, he, we he see, tripled his numbers in the show. It, it does, it is remarkably effective at like reminding you that Joel is not a great person, actually, because I think the yeah. sequence with the with the two the two guys that work for David that he just horribly tortures them and then murders them anyway. Like these guys mm. work for David, they sucked. No no arguments here, but like you leave that scene going damn this dude is fucking fucked up yeah yeah um, when joel and, enters uh, parent mode like he there's yeah. no stopping him and and the the thing the thing that he uses um you know we see both both with these two guys and then also with the that uh, native american couple at the start of that one episode of like uh, point to the place on the map where he's at and then uh, hope yeah. that hope that your your partner 
uh, points to the same place type thing. You know, we it's funny. It's it, again, this is one of the, the moments where I think the show is really effective because that that concept, that thing that Joel does, is introduced to us in this kind of played for comedy scene between these this old couple that just lives by themselves in this cabin in the middle of nowhere, and so we're introduced to the concept there in this kind of harmless scene. And then we get to see it used to its full effectiveness in the scene with those two David guys. And, yeah. and it just, it's kind of, it, it just throws you for a loop a little bit and you're like, Oh fuck, actually this is, yeah. <laughs> this is awful. <laughs> I, and I, I, the, the scene in the final episode that I know got audible responses from the people I was watching it with was when, Joel's in the middle of his rampage and there's a few people who like surrender and drop their guns and yeah. then he shoots them anyway because he can't, yeah. the, you know, no risks. Like somebody who dropped their gun might be able to come after him later. Um, yeah. And like the, I, those moments really help that ending land as a like, Joel is doing fucked up shit here. Yeah. And I mean, he does the, the doctor. He just like mindlessly shoots, although he saves mm. all those nurses, right? I guess Joel is a, um a, a <laughs> pro pro nurse because he just lets them go depends on the joel because i i have to put <laughs> i have to dob myself in here and say those nurses did not survive my playthrough i um <laughs> i fully inhabited the joel persona as i was playing um oh my gosh and had great. to had to reconcile that after i was done mm-hmm. well i i do think that's what the game kind of wants you to do because yeah and again, Joel, he, he rationalizes it. You see, that's what he says to Marlene is that like he kills her because you'll you'll come after her. And I can't let that happen. Mm. Yeah, it's fucked up, man. It's real fucked up. <laughs> what a guy. Yeah. What a good guy that Joel. He's a hero. <laughs> yeah. Um, jumping a little uh, back a little bit to what you were saying, though, I, I did want to call out something the game does uh, by talking about the. Uh, the impact of killing people in the game Mm -hmm. there was one thing that uh and i played the remake so maybe it was only a remake thing but um there sometimes the very last enemy in an area would like drop their weapon and kind of surrender Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and at first i (laughs) i just killed them straight away because i was in a video game and i Uh uh, you know they're not people, whatever. And it, 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 what happened about the third or fourth time, I started to be like, oh, what, what's the game trying to do to me here? And so I, I let one of them stay alive. And sort of the second my gun was no longer aimed at him, he went and picked his back up again and started shooting at me. So <laughs> I then went yeah. sort of back to, to no prisoners. But it, it was a little detail that really started to humanize some of these hordes of enemies for me. Is that they're like, there yeah. are a few guys who are like, trying to negotiate with me as people and the game still kind of forced me to kill them because if i didn't they would come after me and that yeah that was helping train me to be more like joe and i found that like a really interesting little choice and no spoilers but i think the second game has doubled down on little details like that that's really fun yeah the second game definitely tries to humanize the the random schmoes a lot more um and it, two two re- really effective ways in my opinion i do think this is one of the interesting things where you know i see the critiques of this game and 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 i i it's not that i disagree with them like i'm saying yeah i see your point i just don't feel that way is stuff like what you just said like like the game allows for the situation where a guy surrenders to you and then basically the way the game is programmed you can't let him like you cannot yeah. let that person actually surrender. And, and, and some people's arguments were, well, if you don't have a choice in the matter, what is the point of that? And, and I think the point of it is exactly what you just said. The point of it is the game. Th- this is a story about a character named Joel. You are inhabiting the character. Yes, but he still has a character with traits and the game is training you to be like this character. And the, what yeah. the game is teaching you is that is why this guy feels like he has to kill everyone why he feels like it is it is more dangerous to leave people alive than it is to not and i think it's just that's really effective man yeah i agree and, and, and I, that argument of why i give choices if i don't get to make a choice definitely i i think it is one of those cases of diff, different games are doing different things and i think yep. and, and, you know i struggle with this at times too people who follow the game global have seen me do it live um like different games are doing different things you need to try and gauge with the way it's telling its story. I'm like, there are other games where you make choices and that affects things. And like, that's 
what that game is it's it's creating a story that you tell and that you know is is a a thing only games can do so it is a really interesting thing to watch games do but that's not as you said that's not what the last of us is doing the last of us is telling joel's story and trying to put you in his shoes so that's why these aren't choices yeah ultimately this is a game that is yeah it's telling its own story it's using the format of video games to uh to to make the story affect you more because you are the one you know with your hands on the trigger technically despite the fact that that despite the fact that the game does not allow you to choose not to pull the trigger it is still using the fact that you have to pull the trigger to more emotionally affect you and, and tap into your uh challenging you with with the events that are happening yeah so yeah i mean i i agree like i i think choice in video games is is fascinating and cool and i love games that allow you to choose make choices like this that affect the story Mm. i think that's really interesting but not all games are like that and certainly this is not one of those games yeah Yeah, exactly it seems like an unnecessarily narrow view of how video games should tell stories to insist they all do that yep i agree Um, i totally agree yeah I didn't expect us to have a whole conversation about a video game where we basically agree on all points. Yeah, I, I, I really didn't think this was going to happen. I do. I do think the last of us uh, over the last few months has ca- caused me to, to, you know, de- like move, move some posts around and how I, how I think about video <laughs> games and stories for sure. Like I think really sitting down and engaging with a very story heavy game like this has caused me to, um, have to have to reflect on some of the really you know full-on opinions I, I have about them generally speaking i think that's really cool and, and i think you know honestly the conversations i've had with you about games in the past despite being bewildered at some of your opinions sometimes <laughs> have really forced me to like reframe like th- there's been moments where you've made points about why should i care about a story in a game if xyz where i'm just like yeah but uh, but <laughs> And I have no, I have no actual response to that because it's like, so that's a fantastic point. Damn it! Um, so <laughs> I, I like this is why I love talking to you about this stuff because yeah, I mean it's it's really great getting to see other people's opinions on this stuff, and um, I, I'm glad I'm glad you enjoyed this game. I really am uh, because I, I think it's absolutely wonderful. Yeah, I'm I'm glad I finally gave it the chance it deserved, and yeah, just in time to get people hooked on the TV show and then try yeah. and sell them on the game after the fact too. what <laughs> one, one final think... question about the tv show actually um because we've been going we've been going for a while yeah. man um the the final episode opens on a flashback sequence to ellie's birth um and we get mm. to see we get to see ellie's mother uh who we did not see at all in the um the the television or the the game and ellie's mother is played by ashley johnson who is the voice of ellie in the video game which is a really cool little ha- wink yeah uh, which the show does that multiple times throughout the season um what did you think of this sequence uh, and and the the place that it was in the game and and or the the, the tv show rather i I thought it was an interesting way to reintroduce Marlene because like, again, the average person hadn't seen her for eight weeks. Um, aside from that, I don't, I like, it was neat is, is, is probably as, as polite as I can mm-hmm. be about the rest. I, 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 I wasn't a huge fan of the, I, the seeds it planted about why Ellie was immune. Yeah. Um, and then uh, like, and then aside from that, I don't really know what it added. So I, I I wasn't particularly warm on it, if I'm being honest. I, I liked Ashley Johnson and I liked <laughs> um I liked seeing I liked the opportunity to pause in a convenient spot, remind my family who Marlene was. But aside from that, um I, I don't think the show would have lost much for losing it. I'm so glad you said the Marlene part because I, I am in general agreement where I think you could carve that whole sequence out of the show and lose nothing character wise or plot wise with with like i I honestly think there's a there's a moment at the end of the episode where marlene is talking about you know that is trying to explain to joel how devastating this choice is to her as well and is saying like i made a promise to her mother Mm. to keep her safe and i'm breaking that promise and i think i think her performance there is is effective enough to give us everything we needed to know about that scene without actually having to see that scene play out, which is what the show did at the beginning of the episode. Um, but yeah. d- no, t- to your point, I think reintroducing Marlene at the beginning of the episode is actually smart from a, 
a week to week watching perspective because I, I didn't think about the fact that people might not even remember who that person is. So just reintroducing her in that sequence and reminding people not only of who she is, but that she does have a relationship with Ellie before that this final climactic moment. I think that's a smart move. And that kind of in that to me explains exactly why they did this sequence. But but I think I agree yeah. with you. I, I, I didn't love it. I agree. I didn't love the lore stuff about, well, the reason she's immune is because she was bit. Her mom was bit while she was giving birth. And this real like I, I liked yeah. I liked the immunity being this nebulous unknown thing, actually. Yeah, I agree. Because that's that's often how it is in in real life. Like, there's mm-hmm. not usually a reason somebody's immune to a disease. Yeah. It, it's just kind of often dumb luck through genetics and epigenetics that it yeah. just kind of yeah. falls into place. There doesn't need there doesn't need to be a reason, I don't think. And now this is like a reproducible s- scenario. We're gonna yes. like get, find some pregnant women and get them bit during labor and see if we can reproduce the strain of immunity. Well, not if not if Joel is anything. He's gonna he, he'll just do it. He'll do it again. Um, no, I think they do. They do make a bit of a deal out of uh Or no, it's mostly in the game. I think the game makes a bigger point out of the fact that the doctor is the only one who can sort of still do this. Like, yeah, kind of for understandable reasons, there aren't a lot of molecular immunologists in the world. Uh, Twenty years after it ended. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I feel like the game, the game specifically brought attention to the fact that it was like if this guy died, the Fireflies don't have anyone else who can use Ellie's condition to make a vaccine. Yeah, I don't, I don't. I'm trying to remember if the the show draws that out specifically or not. I don't think it um, does. I don't think it does either, and I, I, it's it's hard to know for sure because I don't know what I'm bringing, what knowledge I'm bringing from sure. from where. But yeah, I, I don't think I don't think I remember that specifically happening. Although man, that that poor doctor, like <laughs> he, he Joel rolls up into the room and he's like, "I won't let you do." <laughs> just immediately <laughs> blows him away. It's like Jesus. Oh, a great deal of detail uh, they called out in the podcast that I'd missed is Joel's not even looking at the guy when he shoots him. He's wow. actually talking to one of the nurses and looking at them as uh, yeah. as he shoots the guy. It's gosh, yeah, yeah. an ignoble death to say the least. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, um, man, I, I I think we're coming up at the end here, and and again, like, I think this is a great show. I really do. It's one of the it's one of the favorite things, my favorite things I've watched this year. I think it's a it's as successful as an adaptation as you can have. I do think you know we we I, I meant to bring this point up earlier when we were talking about the critiques about how if something's not a exact one to one clone it's a bad adaptation. I do think it's really interesting how many sequences in this show are actually just yes. one-to-one recreations of the game. Like, like a surprisingly large amount of them actually. Yeah. I, I was seeing a lot of YouTube videos where people were putting scenes from episodes side by side with scenes from the game. And they were almost like to the second, some of them, yeah. it was crazy yeah. how similar some of them were. Which is an interesting choice, right? Like, I I think it's yeah. like I I do think this is a this is a a show that is kind of torn between trying to make something that fans of the video game are going to go like, oh my god, it's this sequence, it's it's and, and it's exactly the same, and look at it, and also trying to do something creative and new and 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 fulfilling for them, and also trying to bring something to a wider audience that's never had it before, and it does feel in moments like they're like, okay, now we're going to recreate this important scene exactly, and that's going to be we're that's going to be a bone we're throwing to the video game players, just like, just like yeah. uh whenever a voice actor from the show appears um from a game appears in it um and then there's moments where they're like this is this is worth you know create creatively i really felt the need to do something and so i'm going to go off and do something here and then this is the part that's going to appeal to the common denominator of viewer like it, I, it it's a show mm-hmm. that i felt those different moments and those different things at various times throughout the show uh but it did never never really hurt my enjoyment of it yeah well, it- and for a lot of them, it felt like the very big, it was a few of the very big emotional moments that were some of the ones that were one-to-one. And mm-hmm. I kind of got the vibe that it was just because uh, like Craig Mazin was a fan of the game. And that was he why sure. this was, that was why this sort of happened. And 
part of me was like, well, Neil and Craig probably just came in a few of these scenes and were like, really loved it the first time. Let's just do it again. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, uh, but I, I found that a particularly interesting thread because my the moment in the game that affected me the most and teared me up was the bit where Ellie runs away from Jackson because she thinks Joel's going to, well, Jolly's planning to leave her at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where they have the confrontation where she brings up Sarah for the first time because she's just found out about that. Um, and, you know, he tells her he's not her dad. And that, that was the scene that got me the most in the game. And I didn't think the show hit me as hard with it. And they changed a few details. And I, but I, I couldn't tell you if any of those details mattered. Like consciously, I don't know what the difference was. Sure. Um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting to me how I, I felt like one of those grumps at, at that time because I was like, <laughs> something's different. And it didn't, it didn't affect me the same, but I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I like I had this interesting thing where for the most part, I it, it had been so long since I've replayed this game that I did not remember the details of those sequences. Like there were definitely moments like when they're on top of the museum, I think, or the, and they look out and see the domed roof with the sun setting behind it. Those like, OK, yep. this is a shot verbatim from the game. I, I very specifically <laughs> remember this from the game but like the intricacies of those dialogue sequences that are actually one-to-one it wasn't until i saw those youtube videos you were talking about that i was reminded of of how close it was so i never had that yeah that that weird disconnect that must be like this is the same but it's still slightly different um because it's different voice actors and and different stuff but yeah well, and, and as you said, like the, the decision to not change anything is as interesting as the decision to change stuff. Like, yeah, that, yeah. It really speaks to the the process. Like if, if they looked at the scene from the game and said, we don't want to change a thing, that says a lot about their opinions on the scene. I do think it speaks a lot to their confidence in their performers as well. Like, because like, if you're going to, if you're going to like do recreate a sequence exactly, um, you have to have a lot of confidence in your actors to be able to nail those emotional beats just as effectively as they were nailed before. Because if they sure. don't manage to do that, then <laughs> you've just kind of broken things. Because because a lot of times, sometimes you you maybe tailor the scene towards the actor a little bit more, um, and and you kind of couldn't in this these moments. And I think it's a testament to how f- freaking good Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsey are in this this series. Yeah, yeah. I, I love Pedro Pascal, man. He's like <laughs> he's killing it. I, I haven't loved Mandalorian season three so far. I've I've liked. I don't know if you you watch that show at all, but um, I I haven't started the new season yet. Um, much to everyone else in the house's dismay, because <laughs> uh, it means whenever I'm in the living room, it can't get put on. Uh, so I, I I'm planning to catch up very quickly. Um, I'm glad I watched Boba Fett based on oh what God. I've seen on Twitter. <laughs> Don't get me started. Oh, yeah. Don't get me. St- I was so angry. <laughs> I went on a, like a full ass 15 minute rant on an episode of the show a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so no, I, I'm keen to get back into it, but um, yeah, I agree. I, I did think it was funny when, when I finished playing the game and then sort of revisited the concept of the show and it was like Pedro Pascal is, is playing Joel. I was like, well, I mean, we know he can kind of do that, like mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> yeah. play yeah. playing the role of the protective dad. He certainly hit that ballpark before. Yeah, there's um so um there's a a possible Dark Tower adaptation happening, um and uh, Pedro Pascal was seen meeting with the the guy who owns the rights to it. Uh, there there's a picture <laughs> of the two of them together, and the internet absolutely freaked out. Um, because the idea of him getting to play the main character role end of that series and like i'm not gonna go like full conspiracy theory and say yes absolutely absolutely um that this is definitely what this 100 percent what this means um but (laughs) he would make he would make a really freaking good role and um so Uh, i hate it i hate it when the internet does that to you it sort of seeds this idea in your head and you're like i can't (laughs) I can't let myself hope, but I also yeah. can't stop myself. It's very normal for people in Hollywood to just meet and have lunches together where they're not talking about <laughs> any specific thing, but just talking about projects in the future and just generally catching up. So the idea that yeah. Mike Flanagan and Pedro Pascal had a lunch once means nothing, or it could mean everything, and that would be really cool. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Well, didn't, didn't the Dark Tower just have an adaptation? 
Um, look, man, we don't <laughs> like to. We don't like to. Oh uh, yeah. It, it was not. It was bad. It was very very bad. Um, and we like. I'm to sure this bad. is a. a I'm sure this is a very fresh joke for for the King, the Kingslingers fans. Is, is <laughs> riffing on the riffing on the adaptation. Yeah, um, it's so funny because like we did an episode on it after we finished the series. Like we, I just had Matt watch it, and we did a we did an episode on it, and we had listeners that were like, "Why? Why would you do that?" <laughs> yeah. it's like I don't know, man. It was there. Might as well watch it. Um, yeah, all right. It's, well, yeah. Anything else you wanted to say? About the Last of Us, we're talking about the Dark Tower now, so I think we've reached the yeah. end. But um. <laughs> no, I was going to pivot to talk about the Expanse for a bit because uh, oh, I gosh, just realized that's another. It. Uh, it's just it's another recent adaptation of a book series I loved that um, the the authors were executive producers on that. There was a it was another one where you got uh, much like with with Craig and Neil, there was insights into why they would make changes and that sort of thing. And um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, it came to my head in the Dark Tower because that's another one which it, that was a great adaptation. It just ended halfway through the series, and I'm still not okay about that. Oh, did they did they formally cancel it? Uh yeah, I don't know. Oh, They've man. been weirdly coy about it. it. There's potential maybe one day or a movie or something, but like, yeah, because this was this was the one that started on Sci-Fi, right? And then Sci-Fi canceled it, and then Amazon picked it picked up. It up. Yeah, and then uh, Amazon got got done with it. Uh, a few more books in, I guess. So damn you, Bezos. <laughs> so it was it was fascinating because the the authors are very active on Twitter, and so it was very funny watching people criticize changes in the adaptation, and then have the authors be like, "No, we're executive producers, and we decided to change that because you know of something that happens in a later book that we hadn't thought of when we wrote this one, or." You know, mm-hmm. because it's a TV show, we can't only cast seven foot actors to play belters, um, <laughs> like yeah. Yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, I, I do wonder, like, if if like with The Last of Us, um, I think they've already talked about how in season two they might stray a little bit further from the source material than they did in the first season. Um, mm. They might, you know, not follow. Uh, part two of the video game quite as 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 strictly and i'm really interested in that idea and like what what yeah. what that means in in action and you know what kind of changes so like i mean i think the cool thing about the last of us as a show is that the the ending is this this like perfect it has finality to it but it also like lays perfect seeds for what's for like excitement about what's to come which i think the exactly the way you want to finish a, a season of television of like oh i feel like we reached a natural ending but also you've laid the seeds for some really exciting conflict to come in the future and so i'm excited to check back in but i'm really really yeah. fascinated to see you know what they do with it and and if if there's moments in the first season that were laying seeds for stuff that they're going to do in the second season that has to do with stuff in the game um for that exact reason you know when they wrote the game they weren't thinking about this stuff at the time and now getting to revisit this material with both completed projects and changing stuff around and laying seeds earlier you know like there's there's just so much potential for all this stuff it's just really exciting yeah like i i i do want to come back and and talk to you about the last of us part two whenever i get around to finishing it um oh hell yeah because i'm really enjoying it i just uh uh, I've had some other stuff going. I haven't gotten to finish it yet, but because uh, having even not finished it yet, I can see structurally why it may not map one to one for TV as as simply as the first one did. Um, yeah, and that that'll be a fascinating conversation to have when we get to talk about it. It was also a much more controversially received uh, game yes. than the first one. I think the first one is like universally beloved and the second one has a, a little bit of last Jediism going on where some people <laughs> really, really, really like it and some people despise it. Uh, so it's, I, I wonder if they, if part of the reason they're, they're like signaling that they're going to make changes is they're trying to like head off the, the people who really, really hated the second game. I hope, I kind of hope not. I hope they don't like, acquiesce to some of the worst people on the internet but what's well, yeah because i i've always been a, a step away like i've known about that controversy 
broadly, but I, I don't really know what the specific complaints are, at, at mm-hmm. least yet, um, where I'm up to. So again, I like that's something I'm really interested in learning more about once I finish the game because I'm still intentionally avoiding reading about that discourse because I don't want any potential spoilers. But once I finish the game, yeah. I want to be like, okay, yeah, what are the complaints and how valid are they? Yeah, no, I definitely yeah. look forward to to having that conversation with you once you finish that game because I think there's a lot there's a lot there and and I I love the game I think it's brilliant but there there are some things about it that I think don't work as well I mean just like we talked about with the show and uh, and and the first sure. even the first game um, but uh, yeah I I think I think even even if it doesn't always work it's it's trying to do really interesting things in, in a really really fascinating way. Um, it's my, maybe yeah. a bit too long. Maybe it's a bit too long. <laughs> <laughs> I was shocked when somebody told me I'm only at the halfway point. I was like, I've probably got <laughs> probably got like two hours left. Um, yeah, I think no. I think it's like just about double the length of the first one, honestly, um, which is wild, crazy. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, that is the Last of Us uh, available now. I I think they released it on Steam recently. Actually, did you know that? Yes, I've heard. Not very good things about the Steam port, though, oh, like no. performance-wise. Oh, no. So uh, maybe if you're if you're not a PlayStation person, maybe just keep your eye on that and wait for some patches yeah. to Im- improve performance. But um, good call. yeah, my understanding is that uh, it hasn't it hasn't come out of the gate in fully working status. There was actually a, a great bug I saw um, for some of the cutscenes. All the characters were just really wet, like they're all just dripping. <laughs> Wet, like like they were, ju- like they just emerged from water, but constantly through the whole cutscene, it was hilarious. Um, oh, I love video game bug. Yeah, That's incredible. <laughs> oh my gosh, I don't even know how that would happen, but I'm no, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, it's it's bizarre, but yeah. So I think there's there's a lot of bugs and and people are complaining that even on very good computers, it runs very slowly. So man, that's unfortunate. Um, yeah, especially because they they released it right after the show. It's like the mm-hmm. if I, I'm sure that's what happens. They prob that happened. They probably kind of rushed it out the door to ride oh, the yeah. show's hype, and uh, it's a shame. One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so maybe don't get that on Steam. But <laughs> if you want to play it, it's on <laughs> PS4 and PS5 and shit. It's still you probably can still buy a used copy for PS3, right? I imagine so. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, hopefully the Steam version will be playable soon. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, the television show is available via HBO Max or HBO, or just nor- just HBO. I don't. Yeah, whatever they're gonna call it next. Whatever month. they're calling it, I can't keep track. <laughs> it's or it's on it's on binge here in Australia for all those all those Aussie listeners. I still can't believe they named a streaming service binge. It oh, it's awful because if you ever need to Google something about it, it you, good luck. Like it's yeah. a terrible. It's it's an ungoogleable name. Let me just find binge TV. Oh, okay, yep. seven, seven million entries. Okay, <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, especially like it's impossible to check if a show is on binge unless yeah. you search binge itself because you can't search Last of Us binge and get <laughs> results about the streaming service. It just you just Do, can't. So we have an app that I don't know will work for y'all, but I have an app that I use called Just Watch. Yes, no, and we I, just watch works in Australia. It's okay, it one of my favorite okay. websites on the internet. It is so key to my life yeah. because like just there's too many freaking services and it <laughs> yeah, I, I I use that like basically 5 times a week. Um mm, same. Gosh. Yeah, yeah, I think I just watch is great for uh, a lot of countries, which is yeah, what a service. That's good. That's good. I, I I guess it like knows which country you're in because only only my services are the ones that that it populates when I search. But I guess it knows where you are. Yeah. It yeah. It, it. Yeah. That's exactly what it does. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, that's all we had for you folks this week. I want to hear your opinions, though. I'm sure Elliot does too. Uh, what do yeah. you think? What did you think of the Last of Us television show? Was it successful? What do you, what what is a what what is a good adaptation? What does it mean to be a good adaptation? <laughs> Maybe we can get a, a definitive answer to this question. Uh, yeah. If you want to let us know, you can reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com. On Twitter at doofmedia, you can go to our subreddit r slash doofmedia where we will have a uh, a thread for this episode, and you can leave your comment there. What's a good adaptation? Is it The Last of Us? I don't know. You tell <laughs> us. 
No, only the Mario movie. It's the only good <laughs> adaptation. Um, yeah, and if you're not already subscribed to this podcast, we encourage you to do so and ensure that you never miss any episodes. You can find us on iTunes uh, or I think it's just Apple Podcasts now, Stitcher, YouTube, know. Google Play. Uh, wait, just wherever you, you get your podcasts generally, you can probably subscribe there. I think Google Play is just called Google Podcasts now. I, we haven't rewritten this part of the script in a year and a half. but <laughs> uh, Yeah. Well, there's no point because it'll change again by the time you do. Yeah. It's just if you search for podcast and doofcast, yeah. you'll, you'll get there. You'll get there. <laughs> and if you like what we do here and want to support our show, you want to support Elliot and Ruben and Pale Reflections, you can do so at Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash doofmedia and donate at any of the available levels there Uh, we've got tons of great bonus content for you every month we're doing another episode of other levels of the tower on stephen king's creep show in a couple weeks and then after that elliot what's what's on tap for the high ground you've just finished jurassic park or the jurassic (laughs) series right yes uh yep ending on the high note that is jurassic world 3 uh (laughs) dominion uh we're now moving into an interlude that i just just want to emphasize I had no role in choosing. Uh, we'll be watching R.I.P.D. 2, uh, <laughs> the direct to, well, iTunes store uh, <laughs> sequel to a movie I've never heard of uh, about ghost detectives or something. The, the so, first one uh, had Ryan Reynolds and Jeff Bridges in it. Oh, why are we doing that? Okay. <laughs> this um, one does not have those people in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the High Ground is a show where we watch uh, all sorts of weird stuff and, and just generally laugh with and at them. Um, but yeah, it's it's a very non-serious laugh of a show, hopefully. Um, so yeah, that's that's what that's what's happening on there. You do know what RIPD stands for, right? I just want to make sure. It's like the rest in peace department, surely. <laughs> it's exactly what it is. <laughs> You'd be crazy <laughs> not to. <laughs> what a concept. Wasn't this a comic? I think it was a comic. It sounds like a comic. It, that's That does sound comic-y now that you say that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, if you want to listen to to Elliot uh, be subject to having to watch R.I.P.D. 2 <laughs> without watching R.I.P.D. You can do that over on our Patreon. Uh, and there's a huge backlog of episodes. Like Elliot said, they watched every single Jurassic movie. Uh, Elliot decided that that some were better than the first one, which is the most ridiculous thing <laughs> you've ever said. Uh, but it's it was a really fun series and there's a bunch more out there. So uh, so check it out. Uh, yes. And also, please consider rating and reviewing this show. Uh, as well as any of the other do shows, those reviews really help all the apps give us exposure and introduce more people to the shows. Uh, and that, yeah. you know, helps us grow and do more stuff. Those damn algorithms, man, they're tricky. You have to appease them <laughs> constantly. Yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and I still don't fully understand how they work. Nope, me neither. The, even like the most popular successful content creators have no idea how they work because like yeah. <laughs> you'll have someone just like appear on TikTok and just be like, well, I'm just making this video because the algorithm hates me. So please, I don't know, interact with this video so people will fight. <laughs> it's just, it's wild how this stuff works. All right, Elliot, thank you so much for coming on. This was, uh, we talked for a long time, but I had such a great time. I, I love this game and I really enjoyed the show and I was itching to talk to someone about it because Matt just refused to play or watch it. So I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad we got to do this. Yeah, I'm I'm very glad you and uh, people like Dawn and Twilight on our Discord uh, talked me into finally giving it a chance. <laughs> yeah, good, good. There you go. You got to listen to people, okay? When people <laughs> tell you if the stuff's good, you got to listen. No, one and done. <laughs> well, we'll have to have you back on again, hopefully not another uh, three years from now. Yes. Um, <laughs> And uh, and maybe maybe we'll convince Matt to at least watch the show so we could at least talk to him about what he thought about the television show. 100 <laughs> percent. All right. That's going to do it for us this week. Thanks again, Elliot. Uh, we'll see you next week. I believe we've got a council episode on the list. I still have to get the poll out for our, our illustrious council. So I will do that uh, right after this. And uh, so we'll, we'll be talking about some movie. I don't know what it's going to be yet, but that'll be <laughs> next week. <laughs> we'll see you then. Let's go.
Doof, and you'll do what I say. Woof, woof. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say. Woof.